gladness and your joy that you placed inside of us. We ask, Lord, as we worship this morning, that your spirit would guide us, that you would help us in every way possible to lift up your name in a holy and righteous manner. Help us, Lord, to be worthy to do the worship that you've called us to do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Our first hymn is uh, Oh Worship the King. It's number 73. And uh, we need to just go ahead and advance that one time where we will be in the right place. All right. Let's sing again. Here. You see that? That orange 
casing here, that insulation, that doesn't go all the way to the plug, does it? You know what has happened over the years, pulling that thing out, pushing it in, pulling it out, the wire got worn down, and it's kind of frazzled in there. So you know what I did? I thought, well, you know, I need that leaf blower, so what I gotta do is I gotta replace this plug, or I gotta get a repair thing for it, so what I'll do is I will take out my old trusty tin snips. I use tin snips for everything. They, they're really nice, okay? I mean, they're really sharp. You don't want to get your finger in there, right? And <clears throat> I came up to that wire, and I just went. I started to mash on that thing. You know what happened? The lights went out everywhere. I mean, pssst, and this thing started fizzing. Matter of fact, Gene, if you hit that button one more time, that was me. <laughs> That's a picture that somebody actually took of me. No, it's not me, but you get the idea, right? That's what happens when you run afoul of electricity. You don't want to run afoul of electricity, do you? You want to make sure that you treat electricity with all sorts of respect. Well, I generally do, but by the way, my son-in-law, uh, married to my daughter. He is an electrician. And if any one of you tells him that I did this, okay, you'll get me in a lot of trouble. You don't want to do that. So, but at any rate, I, I, I tried to cut this thing off thinking that, you know, that's the only way I'm going to repair it is to get to the wires in there. I had forgotten to unplug the other end and it was plugged into the electricity. And then and all the lights went out. But you know what? I got a second chance. You know why? Because these tin snips have a rubber insulator on there, and so my hands were protected. Just like the coating on this wire, when you pick up a wire, it protects you from the electricity. These little covers here protect me from the electricity. Now, what does that have to do with being in church? Well, second chances. I got a second chance because, frankly, if you stick your finger in one of those sockets, you don't ever want to do that. But if you grab that electricity when it's live like that, you could be in real big trouble. Not just hurt, I mean, it could really do you a lot of damage in your body, right? The second chance was that I didn't even feel it. I mean, I saw it and all the lights go out, but I didn't even feel it a single bit. Now, this is the first time my wife is hearing about that, and she's going to keep an eye on me from now on to make sure I don't do something dumb like that. But a second chance is a really great thing. I got a second chance not to be really hurt that day, and uh, <coughs> my mower is going to have a second chance here, my blower, I should say. <coughs> but I got a second chance a number of years ago before that, probably when I was about your age. I realized that I had done some dumb things other than just uh, coming to the wire like that. I had, I had done some key things against God. I had sinned. I had done things that were not right. And I realized that all that I learned in church about how much God loves me and how much we can separate ourselves from God with such a people, I realized that I had to say I'm sorry. And you know what? When I said I'm sorry to God, and really meant it, that I didn't want to be like that, He gave me a second chance. You know what that second chance is all about. We have a cross right here, the cross of where Jesus died. He came to die for our sins, and that's where we get our second chance to be right with God. And so, all we have to do is remember that we can make dumb mistakes, we can do things that are wrong, whether it's on purpose or just because we do something dumb. But God doesn't want to leave it that way with us. God wants to help us out of that. And he gives us a second chance. It's like that insulation on those wires, those tin snips. It protects us from the sin that we would do. So I hope that you'll remember that you don't need to wind up like him with the stuff that you do. You just need to trust Jesus. He'll always give you a second chance. You just come to him and ask for it. Okay? Let's pray together.
Lord God, we thank you for second chances. We thank you, Lord, that you give us so many chances. You, you have died for us so that our sins might be forgiven. I hope each of my young friends here would understand that so well that they, that they understand and come to you. Thank you, Lord, for these young people who uh, are in church because they love you and they, they want to worship you. Help us all to be like them today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Gracious Lord, you are 
the King of all creation, and we come before you this morning understanding that you are God, and we are not. And rightfully, we bow before you. We acknowledge you as King and Creator, God, the universe's supreme master. Lord, by your hand, everything was created. At your pleasure, it all exists. And by your strength, we do anything at all. Thank you, Lord, for the kindness that you express to all of your creation in just in the gift of life and every single day. Lord, we pray for our loved ones this morning. We come before you with our prayer list in hand. And Lord, we want to remember all of these as we pray for them now. Lord, we pray for Kenneth Allman, yeah. David Hayes, yeah. Lisa Hayes. Yeah. We pray for Sue Staley. Yeah. We pray for Ethan Clark. Yeah. We pray for Phyllis Owens. Yeah. We pray for Julie Stickler. Yeah. Lord, we pray for Neil Kaiser. Yeah. And Father, we pray for the entire family as uh, Mr. Kaiser's father has passed away. Lord, we pray for a little girl, Sophie Tate. Yeah. Father, we pray for those who are homebound or nursing homes. We pray for Ruth Adams. We pray for Harold Gray. Right. Father, you hear each and every one of these requests. You know how important these dear loved ones are in our lives and why we are bringing them to you. You know everything about them. You knew the day they would be born. You knew the day that you would take them home to you. And Father, you knew everything in between down to the number of hairs on each head. And so, Father, we lift them up to you and ask you to bless. Bless those who are grieving. Bless those who are going through troubled times. Bless those who are going through questioning times. Lord, above all, we would lift those who do not know the Savior, Jesus Christ, as the giver of second chances. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on each heart that's gathered here, but also our loved ones as we think of them in our minds even now who seem to be lost, who seem to not know the Lord Jesus as Savior. And Father, we don't judge, but we pray. And Father, we pray for the other requests on our prayer list, certainly the requests of our heart. We pray for students and educators in the system. We pray, Lord, for uh, the upcoming year, uh, students that will learn, pray for the educators that will teach. We pray for all of the support staff. We pray, Lord, for our government, our country, our military. We pray for first responders in our country and the many COVID victims and their families. We pray for the direction of our country morally, the leadership of government and the decisions that are made. We pray, Father, for your hand to guide each leader that they might understand your desire, your wishes. And Father, if we have missed any prayer request to lift up to you, which is right and good, we pray that you would forgive us for not lifting that prayer, for not lifting a hand, for not speaking up. But Lord, we, we want to thank you for the joy that comes in gathering together and worshiping together like this, the King of all creation. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness. And now as we pray that great prayer that the Lord taught us, Lord, we pray that your, your spirit would guide our hearts as we think about these words and not just utter them from memory, but utter them in a way that it is the deepest prayer of our heart. For indeed, that's how you taught it to your disciples, as you taught them to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Find us the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, this morning, as we uh, turn to God's Word, we are uh, going to be talking this morning about the perfect church. How many of you ever attended the perfect church? Let me see your hands here. All right. Uh, I'm glad, you know, if, if, you, if you came here looking for the perfect church, let me tell you, don't join. Because you'll ruin it. If you think this is a perfect church, anybody that joins this church could ruin it. If this was a perfect church, we'll get to that in a moment. But that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And uh, the past two weeks, uh, we have studied the letters to the seven churches that were written with pen and ink by the Apostle John, just as Jesus told uh, John to write them down. And some of it was not a pretty sight. The seven churches uh, are on the screen there, the names, uh, Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, Pergamon, so on and so forth. But we gave them seven different names, if you remember. We, we talked about the backslidden church, the rich church, the called church, the polluted church, the proud church, the positioned church, and last week, the last one was the uh, Laodicean church, and we called her the Passe church, the church that thought everything was just fine. Well, frankly, it was tough to get through some of that. I don't know if you know this, but it hurts a pastor's heart to think of a church, any church, as being less than what God called her to be. Uh, but today, we're going to focus on a different view. We're going to focus on the perfect church, a church that is perfectly what God wants and what God has called. And that view begs a question that we have all pondered. And here comes the question. I wonder what heaven is like. Have you ever asked that question? Has that question entered your mind? I'm certain it has. Perhaps your child asked you that question and got you thinking. Maybe you visited the doctor and the doctor said that he wanted to do some more tests. You began to think, what if it's cancer? What if it's my heart? What if? And so you began to think about things like heaven and am I ready? Maybe somebody left a pamphlet about the afterlife <coughs> on your front door. Um, somebody started the question moving in you. What is heaven like? Maybe in a TV show that you were watching or you came to church one day and a preacher preached about heaven or preached about being ready for heaven or he preached about hell and you want to know the other side of that story. Well, today we are going to investigate. We're going to look at what is going on in heaven. And so we are in Revelation chapter 4. We're starting with verse 1 and we'll look at uh, all these verses up to verse 11. This is what John the Revelator wrote, because this is what Jesus told me to write. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven, and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like Jasper and Carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder, and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Let me stop right there for a second. Isn't that a strange picture? The wings, eyes, inside and out. Obviously, you know, John is not talking about anything that a botanist or a 
a naturalist has uncovered here. We, you didn't study about that in biology in school. You didn't dissect anything with wings that had eyes within and without. Uh, and so you realize that we're in the middle of all sorts of imagery here. Remember what the, the different things stand for. Colors stand for different kinds of attributes. White is purity or victory, and red is for uh, war. Uh, black is for death, and so on and so forth. And numbers are important. Uh, we'll get into that in just a, another second or so. So these beasts representing other things, and these angels having these eye-covered wings. Uh, could it be that these are God's uh, servants? And we know that angels are God's servants, they're God's messengers. The word angel literally means messenger. And so a messenger does two things, really, or does the same thing in two different directions. First, a messenger of God would carry messages from God to us. And then those angels would also carry messages from us back to God. Now, how exactly that all works out, I don't know. Are these literal messages that we give to an angel? I haven't seen an angel right in front of me. You know, I haven't talked with one where I could see an embodiment of an angel. But I do know this. If God says they're all around us, and even though we can't see them, uh, they can see us and they can see what's going on with us. And I believe that this there's a matter of communication that God uses angels both from heaven and to heaven. All right, let's continue with this now. Uh, their wings are covered all over with eyes inside and out. Day after day, night after night, they keep on saying, this is where your hymn comes in, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne. Keep that number 24 elders in your mind. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you please. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. It's been said that some folks will only come to church to be baptized, married, or buried. Dr. Avery Rogers, that old Baptist preacher, used to call it hatched, matched, and dispatched. The first time they throw water on you at baptism, the second time they throw rice on you when you get married, the third time when you get dispatched, they throw dirt on you, right? Well, they have the same attitude as uh, Dolly in that comic strip. You see it on the uh, on the screen now. The family sitting in church, and Dolly has this bored expression on her face, and she says, how much longer till we go at home? Well, she had to ask it that way because she was in church, right? She had to ask it in King James Jesus. <laughs> Friend, when you come to stand before or in the presence of Holy God, who is the transcendent King of glory, the resurrected Lord of all. Somehow the thought of how long is this going to take? <laughs> or are the Baptists going to beat us out to the cafeteria? I mean, these things ought not to be. And truthfully, if you did come with the idea of standing before the resurrected Lord, the transcendent God of all creation, the one who said, let there be, and there was, and it's everything and everywhere. If you came to stand before him, you'll be thinking about the cafeteria and what time the crown will be there. So let's dig in here to what John saw in this unveiling of Jesus Christ. The answer to our question, what is heaven like? It is a fourfold answer this morning. Let's dig right in. First of all, heaven is a holy place. We sang um, just a little while ago, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, holy, holy, holy. When Isaiah had his eyes open to see the glory of God filling the temple, he saw the angels flying back and forth and he cried, oh, they, they were crying, holy, holy, holy. Isaiah's reaction was what? To shrink away. He told God, he, 
because he knew himself. He said, I, I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't say what I'm seeing here. God is very different from man, and he is beyond description. Frankly, I think, like Isaiah, who was God's chosen prophet from a little child, like Isaiah, if we were to stand in the presence of Almighty God, not only would we not be able to describe him, I doubt very seriously any of us would have the nerve to look directly at him. Did you notice on the screen this picture? I put this on the screen because this is a, this is a great representation of what could be the scene in God's throne room. Uh, you heard the phrase 24 living elders. If you counted the ones who were sitting closest to the throne, there are 24, there's 12 on each side. And then there are four beasts sitting in front of the throne, a glassy sea emanating from the throne. There's an emerald kind of aura around the throne. But if you look directly at the throne, what do you see? You see a very fuzzy image, very light, because there's light emanating from God. What did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. He's talking about the eminence of the glory, the Shekinah glory of God from the throne. This is not something that we are familiar with. Frankly, you don't see this kind of thing every day, do you? Isaiah knew himself and he said, I am a sinner. How many sins, let me ask you a question. How many sins does it take to make a sinner? Just one, right? You say, well, I haven't done this, I haven't done that. Well, that's great. Neither did the broom in your closet. Room in your closet didn't kill anybody, didn't steal anything. It just sits there and waits to be used, right? It's a matter of, if you break the law, Paul said at any point, you've broken the entire law. It's just like that loaf that we talked about last week with the body and the blood of Christ, the, the body of Christ, that loaf, you cannot break off one single piece without breaking the loaf. It's not intact once you've broken, broken a piece, right? This is why we share this loaf. Well, God is different from man. He's beyond description. Like Isaiah, we know ourselves. We wonder how God will deal with us, we who are unholy, in his holy place. But let me tell you something. This wonder inside us, I wonder what heaven's like. And then the preacher says it's a holy place. Holy place. What did Moses do when he realized he was on holy ground? He took off his shoes. And he got down on his knees and he was afraid to talk. This trembling and fear is what prepares us for standing in a holy place. Listen, if you have never trembled before God, you never stood before God in any real sense of the way or awareness that you're standing in front of God. He is a God you would tremble before. Standing before Almighty God will change your perspective on life. Paul recorded that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 and 5, that he had been lifted up to the third heaven. What does that mean? I'm not sure I understand that. If somebody can explain it to me, that would be great. But just wait till after the sermon here. It's not the focus of the sermon. Here's Paul in the third heaven of some of the some of the ancients believe that there are about seven different levels to heaven, but I throw that in with no extra charge this morning. Like John, Paul could not utter appropriate words to describe what he had seen, and so he just called it a third heaven. How unspeakable, how wonderful words cannot say is what Paul was trying to communicate to us, that you just can't communicate, you can't tell anybody what heaven is like. Marco Polo went to the Far East in the 13th century. He saw something that no Westerner had seen. The reports of his discoveries about China were not believed by everybody. And on his deathbed, Marco Polo was given the opportunity and was urged by some to recant and to withdraw the tales that he told about the wonders of China. But his reply was this, I have not told even half of what I see. <coughs> How can you tell the wonder of God's holiness in your words? You can't. You simply let your song lift your heart to him. And that's what our song is all about. Look at the first verse of Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Early 
early in the morning, our song shall rise to you. Why do we sing in a worship service? It is because we cannot describe how wonderful God is. We use the best we've got. We use what he has created, our voice. And we lift that voice in praise to him. Early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. So it's a holy place, this heaven that we all wonder about. Secondly, heaven is a holy place full of majesty. The crowns and the beasts, as we've talked about, these uh, beasts and 24 elders with crowns on their heads, they speak of the royal nature of God. Uh, the four beasts, the lion represents nobility. God is noble if no one else is. The calf represents strength. Think about what it took to create uh, the world and the universe as we see it. The man indicates wisdom or at least cognitive ability. God knows what's going on. And the eagle speaks of grace and speed. Now the 24 elders, 12 on each side here, represent the leaders of worship in every age. In the Old Testament, there were 12 tribes of the Jewish nations. You've heard of the 12 patriarchs. Um, these were uh, the sons of promise, and they were the leaders of the 12 different tribes Added to this group on the other side of the New Testament dividing line are the 12 apostles of the New Testament. These elders, these leaders of the worshiping community in every age, the scripture says that what John saw was that they took off their own crowns. What are crowns? It's a symbol of authority. They took off their own authority and along with the angels and all the angels, there's a host on the screen there, behind those 12 elders, uh, all of the hosts of God's people, including the angels, these have taken off every symbol of authority, every symbol of uh, achievement, and they bow down to the only true majestic one of the bunch, who's King Jesus. Simple as that. They take their crowns off, and they cast them before the Lord Jesus. If you are Billy Graham, Wonderful. If you're a murderer on death row who's converted at the last hour, it doesn't make a difference between the ridiculous and the sublime, let's say. If you're converted at the last hour or you've been a great saint and useful tool like Billy Graham was, there will come a time when every one of us at either end of that spectrum we will all bow before the throne to worship. All the saints adore him, as the second verse in that psalm says. But listen, whether you're a saint or you're a hardened sinner, scripture declares that every soul will bow before him. No one is excused from that meeting. What is the old terminology about meetings? You know, you call a meeting, and if you get 50% of the attendees, you're in good shape. Um, if El Sue were here, I'd ask how many we have in the role. You know, we have a, about 100 people on the role in this church. How many are here? Right? We got 35, maybe 40. Um, so Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 14, verse 11. The scriptures say, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. That's the reality. One day, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Not a wrong thought to begin that practice right here. Our worship, I think, ought to include bowing before God. Uh, I don't know if you've attended uh, other church uh, functions uh, in other church buildings where you have kneeling rails in front of you. Just about every Lutheran church I've ever visited has a kneeling rail there. Catholic churches have kneeling rails that you can kind of flip down and you can slip out of your pew and just, just kneel on there. We have a kneeling altar up here. Our worship, I think sometimes we Methodists don't do much of that because the Catholics are doing it or another denomination may be doing it. We don't want to be confused with them. But in heaven, those who have already gotten used to kneeling are going to be way ahead of us. 
Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. That's the representation. You see right in front of the throne, the shiny uh, area there in front of the seven flames of the sevenfold spirit of God. You see little kind of a glassy, watery area. That's the glassy sea in front of the in front of the throne. John is describing for us what he sees in the best language he has available. Cherubim and seraphim, two kinds of angels, falling down before thee, who wert and art and evermore shall be. What did Jesus say? I am. I am the one who did come. I am the one who's here now, and I am the one who's coming again. So we have a place called heaven that is a holy place, and it's a place full of majesty. And thirdly, heaven is a one-of-a-kind place. One-of-a-kind, you will not find any other place than this heaven. This is a dark world in which we live. By contrast with heaven, which is filled with light, on every hand, the evil that's prevalent in our day attempts to push Jesus off to the side to trivialize the gospel. John looked at the throne, one of the things that he noticed was there was only one seat. Why is it a solitary seat? Because there is nobody like Jesus. Many have tried to include Jesus in their life. And that the key word there is include. What does that mean? They try to make room for him among all the other stuff, the people, the interests that we have. The reality is that Jesus is life. You don't include him as part of your life. You accept his life as your life. There's a big difference there. You say, what do you mean, preacher? You know, I've, I've got things that I've got to do. That's true. But all those things that you've got to do, Jesus is interested in them. And he's interested in bringing his life, his light into everything that you do. Remember what I said the last two weeks that our job as believers is wherever we find ourselves, whoever we find ourselves talking to, Wherever the conversation opens, we are to take that conversation cross country to where Jesus is. You see, that is our whole function. When it comes to living or not living, you don't make room for breathing. Either you do it, it happens, or you don't. It's the same way with Jesus. You have life in him or you don't have life. There's another lesser throne than the one in heaven, and that's the one in everybody's heart. I have one of those thrones in my heart. You do too. It's called the will. It's called our uh, personality, if you will. And on that throne, in each of our hearts, there is room for only one. It's a singular seat. And it's more than important who it is that's sitting on that throne. It's that way because the choice determines everything about where you will spend eternity. Frankly, let me not be muddled here. If you're sitting on the throne, you spend an eternity separated from God, sitting on your own throne in heaven. If Jesus is sitting on that throne in your heart, making all the decisions, then you spend eternity with him. The problem with sitting on that throne yourself is that the responsibility is too big. It's so big that the shadow of it casts, the, the shadow that it casts blocks out any view of God and anything Anything that gets in between you and God separates you from his loving care. Have you ever done this? Have you ever looked up into the sky and realized that the sun was so bright that you couldn't look directly at it? So what did you do? Right? And the sun disappeared, right? No, it didn't disappear. It's still there, right? You blocked it out with your single hand. Now, there was light all around it, but you did what you wanted to do. You walked it out. It's the same thing with the glory of God that shines in your life. You can say no, and God will allow you to walk it out. You embrace him fully, or you go it alone. He's given us that choice. It's known as free will, isn't it? The Old Testament story of Jacob illustrates this. You remember Jacob? One of my favorite characters, favorite stories, 32nd chapter, book of Genesis. J Jacob was second in line to his father's estate, so he decided he wanted to take matters into his own hand. He wanted to be first. 
He wanted to sit on the throne, not only of his life, but of all of his family. He decided he wanted to be in charge. Eventually, he messed up so bad, he had to leave the very place he called home. Now, all you adults go back to sleep. I'm going to ask the children a question. Did Jacob get a second chance? Come on, guys. Shout it out. Yeah, you bet he did. How did that happen? Well, one night, he wrestled with the angel of the Lord over this thing about being in charge. And Jacob finally said, I am not leaving this place. I'm not letting go of you until the matter of who's going to sit on the throne of my heart is settled. And in that pre-dawn struggle, Jacob got himself off the throne of his heart. And he allowed God full control of his life. It was a life or death matter. And once Jacob got out of the way, he could begin to see the glory of God. Now with our hearts and our voices at one, we put away the sinful eye of man that blocks out God. And we begin to see that there's none but Jesus who should sit on the throne of our heart. He is a one-of-a-kind, unique God who inhabits a one-of-a-kind, unique place called heaven. Look at the third verse of that hymn. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy. The writer of this hymn was saying the sun is still shining even if you try to walk it out. Put your hand down, perfect in love and power purity. So we have a holy place called heaven. We have a holy place full of majesty called heaven. We have a one of a kind place called heaven. And lastly, heaven above all else is a place of God's mercy. Only mercy can evoke true praise. Only mercy can give the second chance. It's only the saved sinner Listen, it's only the saved sinner who can look back and see that he deserved hell and was handed heaven. I love that imagery. We are standing on a precipice and the precipice is melting away. We're about to fall down however many miles into whatever perdition. And yet we are turned in the opposite direction. And we are given heaven. Mercy. That is the mercy of God. What is it that God has been merciful over? Well, if you stop and think about it, creation was an act of mercy. God didn't have to make any of this. He was all sufficient unto himself, but he wanted fellowship. He wanted communion. God's patience over sin is an act of mercy. You know what? The first time you sinned, God's law says, He that sinneth, the soul that sinneth, shall surely die. It could have been instantaneous like that, but God was patient over your sin and mine. God's word, which reveals himself as an act of mercy because he didn't have to tell us what he's like. He could have let us fend for ourselves to try to find him. But he gave us his word. He gave us Jesus, who is the word. And then the cross was a supreme act of mercy with him dying for us. And so what do we do about this mercy? What do we do about this place of mercy called heaven, we praise. We lift up our praise to him. I mean, isn't that why we met here? You know, if, if you came in for any other reason, you missed it. We are here to praise him. If the God of all mercy chose to come to earth, to die, to go to hell, to release the captives and suffer the penalty for our sins, what an incredibly small thing it is for us to return praise to him. Look at the last verse of that hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name. Are you a work of God? Are you a work of God? Were you created in his image? You're a part of his handiwork. You were created by him. All thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. That just about covers all of Holy, 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 merciful and mighty. Boy, those two put together. He's so mighty, he could end it all with a word. Because that's how he started in the first place. But he's so merciful. 
merciful and mighty. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You're familiar perhaps, I'm sure, with the name Johnny Erickson Tata. Beautiful young woman, 17 years old, had a diving accident, became a quadriplegic. Years later, she found God in some very dramatic ways. One time, according to a magazine article I read, she was in a worship service where everybody was asked to kneel in prayer. Now, how is a quadriplegic going to get out of her chair and kneel in prayer? So she was unable to do that, and she began to cry silently because she really did want to kneel before her Lord. Through her tears, she prayed this. She said, Lord Jesus, I can't wait for the day when I will rise up on resurrected legs. The first thing I'm going to then do is drop on grateful, glorified knees and worship you. This is the real test of worship. Does it whenever and whatever we do and however we do it, does it come from the heart in that way? ready to give to him everything he's given to us. Do we recognize that it can never be enough, but we do it anyway because he has said, come into my house. Do we offer our best despite the inadequacies of our human condition? Are we in the worship service to be pleased by a fine choir, a soloist, a neatly constructed and cleverly presented sermon? Are we in the worship for the entertainment or are we here and there to please God and to bow before him and to cry, holy, holy, holy. This is why God placed that wonder in your soul about heaven. About what it's like. And I want to suggest this morning that he placed more than wonder in your heart about heaven. He placed want in your heart as well. It's undeniable you give people a choice between heaven and hell and heaven wins every time. So here's a test. Here's a test about your worship today and the rest of this week. What are you going to do about what you have experienced here today investigating the unveiling of Jesus Christ? And these thoughts about heaven. Will there be any difference about the way that you spend this week? One pastor put it this way, if you could leave your church on Sunday with no feeling of discomfort, of conviction, of brokenness, of challenge, then for you the hour of worship has not been as dangerous as it should have been. Another pastor wrote, if worship doesn't change us, it wasn't worship. So, are you challenged to live in worship this week? Are you different because you've been here and worshiped? And what will you do in response to the mercy of a holy, majestic, unique God who is also merciful? This church, I think I've said something like this before, this church, Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church, here on Pleasant Hill Road, in Seagrove, in Randolph County, in the United States, have I got specific enough to this church? Ain't perfect and get an amen and it's not perfect because you are it oh yeah me too none of us are perfect we don't we don't worship perfectly I don't preach perfectly you don't listen perfectly you don't study perfectly I don't understand God's text as good as I should but what makes this Right here, right now, in this moment, on this day, here in Randolph County, what makes this a holy, majestic, one-of-a-kind place of mercy, perfect in power and love and purity, is Jesus, who is also here with us. There's an attendance sheet in the back over there. Generally, Anna is the one who sits there and checks off who's here. We do that for COVID reasons, you know tracking the country. No matter how many times Anna would look over that list and try to do all the check marks, there's one that she could never see. That's Jesus. He's here. Sometimes when you bow your head, you may hear 
Soft mm -hmm. sound of sandal feet walking in and out the fields. You may feel the brush of an angel's wing recall. What's over the top incredible is that the reason that Jesus is here is because of you. All you imperfect people, because of me, this imperfect creature. He's here and he's waiting for us to break out into joyful worship. To lift our hands in praise, ready to charge the gates of hell with the good news that Jesus saves. And nobody is too good or too bad to come to this altar and offer him that worship. We don't offer an invitation every service. We don't do it often, actually. But you can do that right now as we sing. We're going to sing a hymn. We're going to sing a hymn that is so appropriate to all of us. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. You can come and offer praise by bringing your offering to put it in the plate. You can come bringing your commitment to join us here as a member of this church in its prayers, in its presence, gifts, service, and worship, witness. You can come in any need you have to be prayed for and loved and welcomed. You can come here because you're not perfect and you need to be forgiven and have treasure in heaven. God's holy, majestic, one-of-a-kind place of mercy, perfect in power, love, and purity. Oh yeah, you can come to the altar because Jesus says so. Pray with me. Father, in this moment as we consider giving our hearts lives to you in new ways perhaps. Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon us, that you would give us grace from the ever-flowing fountain of mercy of yours, which is filled with your majesty, and your power, and might. Lord, we thank you for this time. We have been able to unveil a little bit, just an inkling of what Jesus experiences with you in glory in that holy, majestic, magnificent place called heaven. Father, we know that that is the eternal home that we want to go to. Help us now, here, in this time, real time, to offer our praise to you in ways that satisfy you and point us in the right direction. We pray this in Christ's name. If you have a commitment of life that you would like to bring to the altar, you're more than welcome to come as we sing. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. This is a this is a great hymn. It's truly a worship hymn because it speaks not a word of testimony to other people. This speaks a word of praise to who God really is, and we speak directly to him. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. You see, this is a worship hymn. This is a praise hymn. So go, go in the love of our Father, go in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, go in the strength of knowing that Jesus Christ loves you and died for you. Amen. God bless you.